What's going on, everyone? Matt Savoka here from Awesomeo.com, and we are back on the Awesomeo Best Ball channel talking about some more strategy, especially as these tournaments start to release on all the major best ball sites, especially on Underdog Fantasy. There is a ton of strategy to dig into, and today we are going into the big broad topic of optimal roster construction. If there was one way to construct a tournament winning roster, we would all be millionaires by now. <laughs> Obviously, we operate in the gray, but we need to talk about some best practices. And here to break it down with me today is my buddy, Nick Lepre. Follow him on Twitter at NotoriousFNTSY. Nick, how you doing today, man? I'm doing great. I'm very excited to talk about this topic. This could be a very interesting topic for people who are newer to best ball and even for those who have been playing best ball for a while maybe now you're going to be able to get an even better idea of what other players are doing yeah and, and that's a great way of putting it and also what we need to talk about too is we're going to be going position by position today but you need to be thinking broader than that you need to be thinking yeah. overarching strategies and we have some other strategic videos on this channel some already released some soon to be released that will go into these topics but today we're going to go position by position and talk about optimizing our roster construction by each position and i think that's going to yeah. help help a lot of people and talk about what decision uh what decision points we're getting to in drafts so that you can figure out okay this is how i want to kind of optimize the quarterback position this year this is how i want to optimize each position one by one. Let's get into it. You ready for it? Yes, sir. Let's do it. Well, before we do, like and subscribe this channel. What a fake out by me. And uh, hit that notification bell, too, so that you always know when we're going live. We will be going live on this channel as we get closer and closer to season's start. We start, as I mentioned already, with the quarterback position. Hey, we can talk all we want about late round quarterback and positional value. I like fantasy points when I play fantasy football and quarterbacks score the most of them. How has your view of this position changed as we start searching for spike weeks for big weeks from the quarterback instead of just a usable week like we do in season long fantasy? Yeah, like you said, it's very interesting how completely different my mindset is when doing a best ball draft compared to a redraft fantasy draft because a redraft, I most of the time you can't catch me drafting the quarterback in the first five, six rounds. Normally, I wait until like round 9, 10, 11, 12, taking those high upside quarterbacks that while people don't have the rank inside the top 10 or 12, I think could catapult their way up there. And it's a lot easier to do, right? Because you just draft a quarterback. If they're not so good, you just cut them, find a new guy. You can typically in most leagues, unless you're playing in a league where people hold like three quarterbacks, you just keep changing your quarterback every single week. But in a best ball draft, when you weight on quarterbacks there's people picking up quarterbacks left and right so i typically like to go early on the quarterback position sometimes i'm drafting a quarterback in the sixth round and i draft another one in the eighth round i'm drafting quarterbacks early and often and especially on these quarterbacks that go super early if i have to take josh allen in the second round there's no way i'm doing that in my redraft league but i'm going to do that in the best ball draft because i know that i want to get that stack i know that i want to get a quarterback that is going to have those crazy spike weeks. Josh Allen could potentially put up 35 plus points. Now, am I saying that that's going to happen every week? No, but the spike weeks for these quarterbacks are way more predictable in my book compared to a, say, Daniel Jones, Matt Ryan, who you're taking that late round shot on later that maybe in your redraft draft, they could win your championship, right? If things go well, but what are the odds of that happening? You know, succinct, concise, but also highly accurate. Yes. It would be great if we knew what quarterback outside the top 12 is actually going to return value in a huge way because they are going to be usable like a top 10 quarterback every single week. There's probably going to be one person. And if you want to take your chances on one of those players or two of those players over the course of your best ball draft season, absolutely go for it. Let those stacks decide it for you. Uh, think about these team and game matchups. Go for week 17 and week 16 matchups that you really like. But in general, I am trying as hard as I can to get two top 12 quarterbacks. And that means expending a ton 
of draft capital on the quarterback yes. position in a way that might make you feel very uncomfortable <laughs> if you're just coming over to best ball from fantasy leagues, especially if you're trying to take down these bigger tournaments, guys. We need huge weeks. We need a probability of 35, 40, even 45 point games. And the bottom line is, those types of scoring outputs in a one-week sample happen so infrequently from the players that we have at ADP quarter, quarterback 12 and below that it actually is advantageous, looking at historical data, to go with two top 12 quarterbacks and try to win the flex later on in the draft. That feels yeah. strange, but it just means that I'm trying to get two of Justin Herbert, Aaron Rodgers, or Matthew Stafford and Kyler Murray, or Lamar Jackson and, I don't know, Stafford again, Rodgers again. Derek Carr is really the cutoff for me where I then feel like I'm getting into the uncomfortable zone and I may actually just be sitting with a bunch of zeros because I need to make the probability of a top 12 quarterback week in every single week for my best ball team be as close to 100% as I can possibly make it. I know I can never actually fully get there, but this is so important, guys. You need to hit that points threshold because they score the most fantasy points. Any last words before we move on here? Uh, I feel like we got on our soapbox, uh, started off strong with the quarterback position. Yeah, another one of those guys that I'm targeting pretty heavily early on is Dak Prescott. Now, he's not necessarily yes. top five round pick in a lot of drafts. He goes maybe the seventh or eighth round. He's a guy that you can really pair with one of those Lamar Jacksons, one of those higher guys, because it's pretty easy to get C.D. Lamb with Dak, as well as getting maybe the later round wide receivers that are on the team, as well as Dalton Schultz. Great stack to go up uh, go up and try to get. There's tons of options there. We actually went and got a Cowboys stack. I convinced you to draft James Washington, future <laughs> league winner, uh, just, just because we had that stack. But uh, absolutely. Dallas, I said this in an earlier stream this offseason. No excuses this year. Everyone expects you to win the NFC East. The talent level compared to the rest of the division is astronomical. Get it done and... If that's the case, then that offense is going to be just just dandy for fantasy. I thought it'd be fun, Nick, to, to start with the onesie positions. And so we're instead of going to the running back position or wide receiver, I thought we could go with the tight end position because yeah. nailing these what we call onesie positions, because you only start one of them in a typical draft, is really important, one, because the investment in that position, the opportunity cost is extremely high. You're often missing out on extremely high quality flex players when you do so so i do think they work in tandem i know yes. a lot of people like to just go quarterback tight end because they're like all right let me get the onesie positions out of the way in best ball unless i'm getting an elite tight end i actually don't like to do that you're losing so much overall upside so much opportunity to get the number one overall player in a week because they're typically a running back or wide receiver i'm not going to do it but it's a long-winded way of saying we need to nail tight end in the same way we need to nail quarterback. Do you have any general strategies for people when we're talking about the tight end position? Yeah, for me, the biggest strategy I have, it's the same exact with quarterback. I'm either drafting two or three of them, no more. There's no way you should be drafting four or five tight ends or something crazy like that. Same thing with the quarterback position. I've seen people draft like six quarterbacks in drafts. I think they're just trying to be funny. There's literally no reason to be doing something like that. No. So my general strategy at tight end basically is to draft either two or three of them and to try to get more of the late round guys. I am not someone who normally over targets a Darren Wall or a Kyle Pitts in those middle rounds because that's where I like to get the receivers. That I'm going to be stacking my quarterbacks with. That's where I like to get Jalen Waddle and Tyreek Hill and stack them up with Tua later. That's where I like to get those guys. So I don't normally feel comfortable taking tight ends right now. Does that mean that you should completely avoid it? No, I have George Kittle on a bunch of teams, and that's okay. And normally I don't like doing it, but I have to do it because I want to make sure to diversify my team, right? I don't want to just completely draft only late round guys, but there's a lot of guys that go late that I could see finishing inside of the top five. So I'm definitely someone who stays a little bit more quiet on tight end, but compared to a normal redraft league where I basically fade every single draft unless the value is there, I fade the tight end. In a best ball draft, I am more likely to see the value in a guy in the middle rounds and pull the trigger. We defer here, sir. I must say, I take a barbell approach when it comes to the tight end position. I like going one elite tight end early. Mm -hmm. Absolutely love Travis Kelsey in best ball this year. And then I don't even think about the position 
until round 15 or later. I'm usually only drafting one tight, one extra tight end beyond that elite tight end because I need to draft with ceiling in mind. I need to think that if I spend that draft capital on that high round tight end, then I absolutely believe that they're going to hit their ceiling. I don't yeah. need another tight end until very late, basically to fill out the bye weeks. If I don't go elite tight end, I am very typically waiting till after round 12 to even start looking at the position and then guaranteeing that I get at least three. I have had four. I don't like teams that have four, but it's not the craziest thing. Again, if you do not start until after the premium draft rounds, as I would say round 13 or later to get all of those players. I just don't really see any extra value in mid-round tight end picks. You're looking at one extra spike week or one extra usable weeks, and in my opinion, that doesn't win you leagues. I'm trying to help people win leagues here. I don't say you're wrong. I'm just looking at the historical rates here. Yeah, and a lot of the time when I'm talking about those middle-round tight ends, those are the guys that I'm also stacking with the quarterback. So Jalen Hurts, Dallas Goddard, Dak Prescott, Dalton Schultz, things like that. If I go for Tua later, I want to get Kosicki, things like that. That's a that's a great point. You're thinking of overarching strategies instead of the simply the position. Exactly what we said to do at the beginning of the stream. That's why they pay, they pay you the big bucks over here. Uh, any last <laughs> words on the tight end position? I think we covered that very nicely. Yeah, something I need to make very clear is make sure you remember that you have to draft a tight end because if you're someone like me who just normally waits forever, sometimes I'm like, oh, wow, it's round 13. I don't have a tight end. Make sure you don't do that. Really pay attention. And even though I do fantasy drafts all the time, right? It's my job to talk about fantasy football. Sometimes I forget. It happens. Well, maybe you're just executing my strategy and not even thinking about the tight end position until round 13. You don't know, Nick. No. You don't know. <laughs> I, I kid. I kid. Guys, make sure to like and subscribe to this channel. And hit that notification bell, too, as well, so that you always know when we're going live. You guys know what to do. That's Nick Lepre at Notorious Fantasy. Follow him on Twitter. I am Matt Savoca at Draftaholic. Those were the onesie positions. Very, very fun. But now we get into it. Now we get into the flex positions, the league winners, the wide receivers. I'm not saying running backs can't be league winners. Of course they can. But wide receiver <laughs> is a strategy all unto itself. You got to start three of them. They often are the top flex of the week especially when we get those multi-touchdown like will fuller-esque weeks i know how you like him but how are you determining the number of wide receivers to take and do you have any general positional strategy as we dig into this one for the wide yeah, receiver with, position with wide receiver most of the time i'm drafting significantly more wide receivers when compared to running backs sometimes i finish a draft with Maybe on some websites you can have double the amount of running backs than you do or double the amount of wide receivers you do as compared to running backs. I am not someone who is very strict on a strategy that a lot of people were using last year, which is the zero running back strategy. I am someone who does like to maybe wait on wide receivers, but I am drafting a lot of them. And towards the end of the draft, I'm taking as many shots as possible on these late round guys that could potentially be a league winner. Guys like Justin Ross, all these super late round guys, even a guy like Will Fuller, who's not even on a team right now. But I think if he goes to the correct spot, maybe the Packers, then he could really be in a situation where he could be one of the better uh, wide receivers in fantasy football. And a stat that I wanted to bring up, because this video is sponsored by Underdog, is that the latest a team's running back one was drafted among underdog fantasy's best ball mania two finalists last season, 66 drafted in round one, 69 in round two. So 41% of the finalists were drafting a running back in round number one and 43% were in round number two. So wow. this huge strategy towards you need to draft running backs later, right? You got to get those good wide receivers early. They're super safe. While maybe that that thought process may be a little bit outdated uh, based upon the information. Now, again, I'm not someone who just has to stick by the stats, but the stats are very telling when 41 percent of finalists drafted their number one running back in the first round and round number two was 43 percent. So I think that's something that a lot of people don't even talk about. And Hayden Winks of Underdog tweeted that out himself. So it's just information that anyone can see. So. That very much influences when you're taking your first wide receiver, it sounds like. Unless a position falls to you, like I saw we took Devontae Adams, Stephon Diggs, yeah. obviously a player that we're interested in. You'll take them at the right value, but in general, you would like to get a bell cow within rounds one and two, 
and then start taking the quantity over quality approach a little bit at the wide receiver yeah. position. And you still want quality, obviously. And in the third round, you're still getting potential league winners and you know a huge amount of usable weeks, right? Yeah, and last year, the 43%, I bet a majority of those guys in the second round drafted Jonathan Taylor, right? Because he was almost the cheat code. He's fallen into the second round, and he becomes the number one running back in fantasy football. So is the are these the exact numbers that are going to be spit out from the Best Ball Mania 3 draft, from the Puppy draft come next year when we're looking back? Probably not, but I do think that that is still a good kind of handbook to almost look at that you yeah. do want to get at least one running back early on in my book. So let's bring it back to wide receivers. Let's talk about positional allocation. How yeah. are you thinking about the wide receivers? So how are you determining the number of wide receivers you want to draft in a draft? How are you incorporating it into those onesie strategies we already talked about? You know, Talk to me about the particularly the wide receiver position. Yeah, and I wasn't trying to divulge into the running back position. I just think that they're so hand-in-hand, right? When you're talking about early on strategy, what I was talking about does go into where you want to be drafting wide receivers. So in my opinion, with wide receivers, I am looking very heavily at stacking. I am looking very heavily on how many wide receivers I draft. Those late-round wide receivers, a lot of the time, I am going to be drafting the team's wide receiver three, the team's wide receiver four, who may have that spike week. So for instance, if I draft Josh Allen, I'm going to want to draft Jamison Crowder. I'm going to want to draft Isaiah McKenzie, these late round guys that I think have the upside. So the wide receiver position is heavily linked to my quarterback in every single draft. I don't always heavily link the quarterback with the tight end, but with the wide receivers, that is always something that I'm looking for. And I'm looking to draft at least two wide receivers from the team that I have my quarterback on. And if I don't do that, then I definitely have to have the tight end in my book. So the wide receivers for me, I'm going to be drafting a lot more than the running backs. I'm going to have at least eight. And I think that the wide receiver position is the most important position to hit on in the middle and at the end of drafts. Hey, that's right. You need to you need to hit a mid-round wide receiver because there's going to be someone in that three through yes. seven range, th- round three through seven range at the wide receiver position who we're going to be drafting in round one next year. And you're going to be kicking <laughs> yourself for all the times you saw him, you liked him, and you didn't take him. I promise you that. If we already knew who that was going to be, we'd pick him every time. But you also need to hit at the end of drafts because we see a lot of players establish themselves as every week contributors in fantasy. And I want to add one other thing to your stack considerations. And this is a little bit, if that's 101, this is 201. Start to memorize those week 16 and 17 matchups because the Bills play somebody in week 16. They happen to play the Bears. So now Darnell Mooney looks more interesting when you have Josh Allen than he did without Josh Allen. That can be a little counterintuitive for people who haven't really done that before. They played the Bengals in Week 17, theoretically championship weekend. So suddenly, other Bengals that we can get outside of T. Higgins, Jamar Chase, maybe Tyler Boyd becomes interesting to you after picking a player, hypothetically, like Josh Allen. So... I do like how your stacks and your quarterback, especially, again, the primary point scorer is leading you into your positional strategy. I actually really like drafts where I can stretch it all the way to 10 wide receivers. And the only way you can do that Uh is a ton of running backs early, except for one round where you take a tight end. Yeah. Pop in two top 12 quarterbacks, usually at the end of that top 12, and then just going for days with the wide receiver position. I just love those kinds of drafts. Yeah, exactly. And the drafts, they're basically tailored to you having four receivers in your lineup at all times, right? With the three receivers and the one flex. Again, depends on the website that you're playing on. They obviously all have different rules and all that, but most websites have three receivers, one flex. And most of the time in my book, you want to have four receivers in the slots. Like a dream start for me, like Kelsey, at the end of the first, you go Kelsey, Whatever running back you want at the end there, I I like someone like Saquon Barkley or Javante Williams. And then you follow it back around. You start the stack with Patrick Mahomes. Then you're looking at the fourth round. You can either go finish out the running back position or you're looking at so much talent, the wide receiver position to start a big run. That was really exciting. Any last words about what you're looking for maybe in a breakout wide receiver? Obviously, we're going to have a breakouts episode later on in the summer, but what you're looking for as you start to fill out your wide receiver position. If, if you look at a specific stat or anything like that. 
for me, it's not really a specific stat. If it was a stat, it would be efficiency. Obviously, when you're looking at a guy that maybe had low volume but was very efficient, that could be very telling that they're going to be able to move up the depth chart. I am someone who loves looking at the depth chart. Now, looking at the depth chart in May is almost dumb, right? The depth chart in May doesn't mean anything. But when you get to July, August, when there's really the, the depth chart actually means something, that's when I'm really looking at the depth chart and looking at positions where I see moves could happen. Like, oh, this wide receiver looks good. Maybe he's going to move up. Blah, blah, blah. Guys that are buried down the depth chart that are, uh, I think, have the chance to elevate. And another thing I look for at the wide receiver position is just how many other receivers they have on their team that I really think are going to be seeing more work, right? There's guys like Amon Ross St. Brown you could have found last year, and it almost was pretty obvious that he was going to be good. And for some reason, I didn't see it. I never saw it coming because they literally didn't have a clear number one receiver. There's teams like that all the time. There's guys that go super late like Brandon Cooks who could really dominate this year because who else is there? What is Nico Collins going to stop him? Probably not, right? So there's ways to look at things. And I have talked about this before. I don't even know if it was if it was on this channel or the fantasy channel, but I have talked about how I look for these late round guys. And it, it definitely does differ per position. Well said, well said. And uh, you're oh, definitely going to find some wide receiver ones in the rough here, I really like Traylon Burks in the mid rounds as you start that. Like, let's say you went low round, uh, early round tight end and a bunch of running backs. Then suddenly, oh, shoot, I need a wide receiver one. Traylon Burks sitting there in the mid rounds as we wait for Robert Woods, Rashad Bateman as well. There are definitely players with a ton of potential, even if you wait till the fifth, sixth, or even seventh round to start that quantity over quality approach at the wide receiver position. Before we dig into the final position here, I do want to remind you guys that we are sponsored by Underdog Fantasy, the best place to play best ball contest. They've got the Best Ball Mania 3 tournament, $2 million to first place, $1 million to second, $1 million to the points champion, and they just launched the Puppy Tournament, $5 to enter, five hundred k to first place and when you use promo code awesomeo you get up to a 100 dollars first match deposit bonus that's as many as 20 entries into the new puppy tournament or four entries into the big boy contest the best ball mania contest truly no better time to get in there remember use promo code awesomeo okay i'm sorry we buried the lead here guys running backs still run fantasy football you get an elite running back outside of the first round, you're probably going to advance into the playoffs. If yes. you get multiple elite running backs on your team, like two or more than your league mates, you're probably smashing your way to a championship. Yes. And if you end up with three or four elite running backs, we're talking top three to five every single week, and no one else has any, you could run the table here. That's how important this position is from a positional value standpoint. The top players outpace the mid and bottom tier players by more, more than ever at the running back position. You talked a little bit about when you start drafting, what are you looking for in your first and second round draft picks as you start at the running back position? Yeah, real quick, I will answer your question. The thing sure. I tried to stop you before, I wanted to bring up vacated targets, vacated opportunities. That is also something I'm looking heavily at when I'm trying to find one of those late round guys, as well as the early round guys, right? If you're drafting a running back and you see that, oh, maybe they're going to see some more targets because some player left and there's like rumors about this happening, that is something I also look at. So in the first two rounds, when I'm looking at a running back, I am heavily biased towards the guy that's going to be catching passes. And that is just something that is very hard to break. The only guy that I'm very comfortable drafting early on that doesn't catch any passes is Derrick Henry. Now, there's going to be a lot of discussion about Derrick Henry. He's not even going to be talked about here for one like another minute, but there's going to be a lot of discussions about him. He's had X amount of carries. He did this, did that. The tread's coming off the tires. Can he keep it up? If he does, he's probably going to be a top five running back if he's able to stay healthy. So he is really the only guy that breaks that mold in my brain of a guy that maybe will only catch 10 balls, but I think he could still finish as the number one running back. So I'm heavily looking at targets in the first two rounds, the targets that these guys can get guys like Alvin Kamara, guys like Austin Eckler, who we are both very high on Austin Eckler. I think Austin Eckler, so do you, could be the number one running back in fantasy football. And I've already moved him up to running back two, I believe in my rankings. I don't know if he'll be able to dethrone Jonathan Taylor, but I am looking for running backs that get a lot of receptions because if you can get a guy that gets a thousand rushing yards and a thousand receiving yards, 
you are sitting very pretty. And there are guys that if you're especially for drafting at the end of the first round, you can easily get a Najee Harris as well as a DeAndre Swift, who may both catch 70, 80 passes next season. Yeah, opportunity is king at the running back position. And right. while targets are always worth more than a rush, goal line opportunities are worth even more than targets. And we yes. feel like we need some way to wrap all of this opportunity in some sort of metric that we understand. And if you ever hear me talking during the regular season, I cannot stop talking about expected fantasy points per game yeah. because it is that metric that helps us do exactly that. How do you value a goal line carry versus a target versus a rush? Let's let the math, let's let the statisticians figure that out. And why don't we just get one number on a scale that we all understand like, fantasy points that's incredibly helpful to me now of course that is last year or previous years statistics that doesn't always imply usage next year but when i look at past usage and then statistical projections like the awesome projections that we have looking ahead and then one big thing for me age because we know that running back cliff happens to every single running back even the elite ones yeah. That's how I'm trying to find league winners right now. So players like Najee Harris, players like DeAndre Swift, Javante Williams. They're very interesting to me. And while I still have Alvin Kamara and Saquon Barkley and player and Dalvin Cook ranked very highly, they are past that age threshold where I really believe that unless everything breaks right, that they're really going to be the number one overall running back in fantasy. And again, this is best ball mania or, or the puppy tournament we're talking about. The someone is going to have the number one overall running back. I need to try to find that. So if we're saying that in the first three rounds, we probably are looking at the running back position twice. I'm looking for volume. And that's absolutely king. I'm looking for efficiency. That's absolutely helpful. But age is my third consideration. I want to be early and catch that breakout year because that's where I'll make the most money. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I agree with that. The stat you brought up originally, I also look at expected points per or points per touch, I should say, from last season. I think that that's very advantageous for looking at quarterbacks. It's points per drop back. And for running backs, receivers, tight ends, it's point per touch. I think that is also a number that should be put into the, the mix when you're looking at ranking guys and figuring out who to draft. Well said. I like that stat a lot. And, you know, if we're taking a quality over quantity approach in general mm -hmm. with the running back position, what does that mean? We're probably going to be close to finishing out our main contributors from a fantasy perspective at the running back position by the mid round, seven, eight, nine. I want to have like basically the players I believe that will be scoring most of my running back fantasy points already on the roster. At the end of drafts, whatever, I'll take a chance on a running back if I feel like it. I want no obligation whatsoever to do that. Yeah, I mean, if stacking wasn't so good for these drafts, I'd probably draft four running backs in the first four rounds and then just be done with it. And I like to do that, to be honest, because, you know, <laughs> you don't get to play the stacking game early. You're not going to get a premium stack. But, hey, I hilariously ended up with a stack that did very well, ended up in the semifinal week of the Puppy Tournament last year. Because it had Jared Goff and Amon Ross St. Brown and Josh Reynolds and a bunch of non-TJ Hawkinson Detroit Lions. And, hey, there were some spike weeks in there that no one else really had. And so I had some unique uniqueness in there. Uh, didn't, didn't get me all the way into the finals week, but it was fun to have that little run there. Uh, so that's the kind of thinking you can have. You can get those early stacks. Our expert consensus rankings are going to be aggressively ranking those early stacks to help you get yeah. into the fold. But it doesn't mean that there's zero potential for a player like Zach Wilson and his two wide receivers. So what does that mean for the running back position? Get those premium players early. Be done with it. Any last yeah. words before we be done with this uh, optimization roster strategy? Uh, yeah, something, something yeah, real quick to talk about is the running back dead zone. That's something people talk about every year. Last year, I, I don't know what I was smoking. I was thinking, you know what? There is no dead zone. I like Mike Davis. I like... Miles Garrett, uh, not Miles Garrett, Miles Gaskin, and that was wrong. So there always is a running back dead zone, which is why, like Savoka's saying, we need to draft these running backs early, and you can just feel super confident drafting a couple early and then waiting a lot later and then just closing your team out with a Damian Pierce, one of those late-round upside guys like the 10th round. Ooh, ooh, ooh. There, we'll close this out with a little nugget. 
That's true. If you want to just stay away from that uh, round four through nine running back dead zone, as they say, go for it. But if you're looking to try to navigate it, look for players with immense efficiency or superior draft capital. I'm talking J.K. Yeah. Dobbins, Travis Etienne, rather than players like Cordell Patterson. Not saying that Patterson <laughs> couldn't be a league winner. I'm saying that more likely than not, it's those younger players with a history of efficiency that come out of that dead zone as efficient fantasy producers. Nick, Agreed. this has been a really fun one. Uh, I love breaking down these strategic articles, uh, excuse me, these strategic videos as we break down all the ways that you can win a tournament on best ball platforms like Underdog. Use promo code AWESOMO to get a $100 first match deposit bonus. Any last words for the people before we get out of here? Yeah, make sure you guys do use our promo code. Make sure you get the free money and make sure that you draft on our dog because it's very fun. And unlike years prior, you know, you don't have to wait till August to draft. You can start drafting right now and you can potentially build your winner in May. The Best Ball Mania winner from last year from Best Ball Mania 2 drafted in June. So it's definitely possible to draft now. Don't just get yourself in a mental pretzel thinking you have to draft in August. You can get a huge edge drafting now because ADPs are going to greatly shift from right now until August. Yeah, yeah. Remember Rob Gronkowski? The first Best Ball Mania tournament we did, we got him in the very last round. Now he's up in the 10th round. I'm sure there'll yeah. be another riser even much bigger than that. This has been a whole lot of fun. We will be back all off season long, getting you ready, getting you prepared to take down these huge tournaments on Underdog and elsewhere. He's Nick Lefrey at Notorious FNTSY. I'm Matt Saboka at Draftaholic. We will see you guys later.